um, uh, thanks, uh, Manoj, for joining in. I, I'd like, I'll, I'll kind of jump in and explain to you why this rewriting the Corbett story is important. Yeah. Because Corbett forever has got a bad press in the sense of the crowds and things like that. One of the things we've been, we've tried our best to do both with gyms and with one guard is to say that we are in areas where uh, we are in an area where that, that, that ma mass tourism, where uh, people are unconcerned about what is happening. That is slightly lower than what it is though towards gyms, of course, more new properties have opened up and things like that. But, it is still much better when you compare to the uh, the Garja, the the Ram uh, Ramnagar road, right? So that is one thing we've been telling the uh, the industry. The second thing we've been telling the industry is, right, just in the way of the activities and the way we are approaching tourism in uh, in Corbett, uh, via Jim's Jungle Retreat, in the activities that you present, um, in the uh, in the projects that you have created, we've been able to do much. Um, We've been able to uh, encourage uh, serious wildlife people to come and stay with us at Jim's Jungle Retreat. And correct me if I'm wrong on that, right? So that is, that is the second one. And third, of course, is also because uh, is also because we have so many activities for children over a period of time. It's become a very good family, um, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a retreat where family can come with kids, and there's plenty to do for children. So. This essentially is the three uh, broad uh, ideas that we've been putting through. And um, uh, uh, one other very important thing is the quality of naturalists with you heading uh, the team. It kind of changed, it, it has helped, uh, helped us in changing the narrative. So while inbound is still, uh, the ideal inbound numbers is still a way out. Uh, the domestic has actually taken quite nicely to through what you offer at Jim's Jungle Retreat and also at One Card. So these are broadly the ideas that we've been working with. And um, we can't ignore Corbett as one of our, the, the first uh, 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 tiger reserved under Project Tiger that cannot be, uh, uh, that cannot be discounted. That uh, uh, Corbett lived here and the kind of work he's done, that can't be discounted. And the third thing is that there is, a, at the end of the day, 50% of our bird population, of the species which, uh, which is uh, of, uh, in the Indian subcontinent, is in the Terai, in the Terai region around uh, Corbett. So that also you can't uh, discount, right? So having said all of this, Corbett still makes a lot of sense, um, uh, has a lot going for it where uh, wildlifers are concerned. So like... Basically, this is uh, what I would like to put forward. And the rest of it is up to you, Manoj. And thank you so much. One of my best uh, uh, forays into the park, I, I never knew too much about um, uh, about the about, uh, Dela Zone. And going with you and spotting elephants and tiger and, you know, a, a pair of tigers in within half an hour going inside and understanding why we are seeing, we are having a sighting like this was another very important thing. So, that is for me is very, very important. The why of things and what is happening at the ground level. And that's what we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Shobhaji. It was very nicely uh, said. I think all the three points that you, three broad points that you made, they're very valid. And uh, it's an amazing park. Uh, we will talk about birding and we will certainly talk about uh, a few other things about Cobbett. So, yep. We can look forward to start the presentation. Yeah, go ahead, uh, Manoj. I mean, uh, Shobha has done a fantastic uh, introduction. So, uh, I mean, for everyone who's here, you know, Manoj Sharma is a he's a birder, he's a naturalist, uh, you know, a nature photographer, author, numerous articles in uh, Indian birds. Uh, you know, he's he's been publishing. And uh, I mean, his, I, I'll, what I'll do is I'll put his profile in the chat uh, because it's, it's really fantastic, uh, you know, to, to be able to have somebody like him present to us uh, this afternoon. And currently he is, you know, the chief naturalist at uh, Jim's Jungle Retreat. He's been there since uh, 2015. And uh, yeah, it's, I mean, I've, I've had the privilege of, you know, going through this presentation uh, today a little bit briefly. So really, it's going to be fantastic. Uh, over to you, Manoj. And Manoj, you also presented a paper on, uh, you presented a paper on uh, 
I, I can't remember what, but I, there was a very, uh, an academic so, paper. Yes. Yeah, so uh, some of these publications of mine uh, will also feature in this. So okay. I want to highlight also that, uh, you know, when we go out to, the, to look for the birds and we see the birds and we identify the birds, that should not be the end of it. What they are doing, what is the behavior, what is new should also uh, be very interesting. It is very interesting. And if there, there is anything that we come across, which is worth publishing, we must publish for the future generations to come because these are very interesting behaviors that we come across. So I will uh, talk about these. So I'm sharing my screen. So if you can spotlight Manoj, that will be great. You're uh, this one, no? So can you all see the screen? Yes. Right. So seek the tiger, find the jungle is the tagline. Cobbett happens to be a reserve which has got the largest number of tigers or the highest number of tigers for any one reserve anywhere where the tigers do occur. And of course, they occur mostly in parts of Asia and most of them are in India. But we have about 250 plus species of tigers, uh, sorry, 250 plus numbers of tigers in Corbett. And this is one charismatic species which attracts everyone. Uh, this cannot be summed up, this tagline that we have, seek the tiger, find the jungle, cannot be summed up in a better way than this tiger face artwork that an amazing artist did for us. If you notice right in the middle, there is an elephant. If you notice my arrow, there are peacocks and butterflies and pangolins and lizards and crocs and grasses and the deer and so on. So when we go to the jungle, everybody wants to see the tiger. But the idea is to shift the focus from the tiger and talk about all these fantastic stories that can be uh, so engrossing for the visitor. And birds definitely feature very high, uh, you know, when we talk about all these things, because birds are some of the easiest things to see, some of the most beautiful creatures to come across. So birding in Cobbett, you know, they say Cobbett is a bird watcher's paradise. It is an amazing place in terms of its topography. Out of about 1,300 species of birds that occur in Indian subcontinent, over 550 species occur in the reserve. Now, we are very lucky at Jim's Jungle Retreat, thanks to the kind of habitat that we have created, that we have recorded the presence of over 250 species of birds on, you know, across the years and based on different seasons. So we get birds in the winter and in the summer and the passage, and then there are the ones that are resident. Now, why do we have so many birds in Corbett? It is so strategically located in the foothills of Himalayas in the region called Babur, which is just touching the Tarai on the south and towards the north are the Himalayas. We get birds across the seasons. Now, if we look at the topography, this is where Jim's Jungle Retreat is, towards the southeast corner. About 15 kilometers away, close to River Kosi, is where Ramnagar town is. Right next to Jim's Jungle Retreat, we can see Dela zone and Jirna zone. And then if you notice the topography, this is the first ridge, the southernmost ridge. Then we have the central ridge. Then we have the Northern Ridge. So these are three parallel ridges and the elevations towards the Northern side would range roughly about 1,350 uh, meters. Whereas elevations around Southern side, Jim's Jungle Retreat and surrounding areas 
would probably be about 325 meters or so. So fair bit of elevation range. As we move towards the north, we cross all these ridges. We come to areas which are more mountainous and we track birds which are more Himalayan uh, species. And towards the south, because the visibilities are good, the habitat is so open and so beautiful, the abundance of bird life is concentrated towards the southern side. Uh, if you notice, River Kosi runs along the eastern boundary of the park. Uh, this is the entrance gate to Dikala, beautiful Ramganga River Valley. And if you just come across somewhere over here is, is uh, Durga Devi zone. And this is also somewhere along the Ram Ganga that we have this uh, lovely little lodge called Vangat. Now, a little bit of uh, information about Jim's Jungle Retreat. About 20 years ago, a little earlier than that, this land was bought about 15 acres of land next to the buffer zone of Kobe Tiger Reserve. This was open agricultural fields. The idea was to recreate the forest. Idea was to plant local species of trees, shrubs and grasses and attract the biodiversity. As a result, over the years when these plantations happen every monsoon, we get multi-story canopy. And when we get this multi-story canopy, we attract all kinds of birds, the birds that live in the bush down on the floor, the birds of the middle canopy, birds of the top canopy. And apart from birds, then we get so many other creatures. We have recorded about 80 species of butterflies, thanks to the diversity of flora we have. About 25 odd species of mammals we have recorded either on the property or we have seen across the fence. And Jim's Jungle Retreat, of course, is uh, influenced by the great uh, conservationists that this area or this country has produced. And of course, Jim Pobbitt himself or his friend, Sir Malcolm Haley, after whom the park was originally named F.W. Champion, who was the pioneer wildlife photographer. And of course, Billy Arjun Singh uh, from Dudwa, who is responsible for creating or saving that landscape. So their ideology, their philosophy makes the basis for Jim's Jungle Retreat. It's a sustainable venture. Uh, we use uh, local architecture. We use local material. We create habitat and we try to merge into the habitat. And then what we created uh, or what we started long ago was the Mahavan project. Mahavan is a beautiful concept. Now in the ancient times, uh, protection to the forest was provided on several uh, scales. The topmost level was Mahavan. This was the forest which was not accessible to anyone followed by Tapovan, which was probably only accessible to the spiritual people who wanted to go there and indulge in Tapasya. And then we had the bottom category, which was for the common man, the Sriva. From this concept of the protection for the forests, the word Mahavan was taken. And this is how we started creating a local nursery. We started creating our own saplings of the local flora, and as a result, we have been enjoying what we get to see at Jim's Jungle Retreat. If you notice the logo of Jim's Jungle Retreat, the footprint logo is also very interesting. You can see a fish here. You can see a reptile, a butterfly and a bird. And then the mammal is represented in the form of a footprint. And then in the pad, you can see the form of a tree. So all the elements of the forest are represented. And this is the kind of habitat at the property, right on the edge of the buffer zone of Kobe Tiger Reserve that we are talking about. Uh, this is a picture that was taken uh, in the winter when we get a lot of winter migrant birds around. Now, Kobe is an amazing place in the sense that we have got birds for all seasons. 
in the winters we get continental migrants these are the birds that come from across himalayas the ones that come from places like tibet and central asia from siberia and near arctic and eastern europe so a lot of these birds push down by the winter cross himalayas they come and spend their uh, you know winter months in the rather pleasant environment of uh, what india offers and then before the summer they go back to their breeding grounds we get altitudinal migrants the birds that breed high up in the himalayas and in the winters these are pushed down and they come and spend the winter here or they spread out into the plains then we get birds which are passage migrants these birds are going from one place to another place and they stop over for some time while they are you know on the move and then we get birds like this indian pitta which is in the middle of uh, this slide the middle image which is the summer breeding migrant so these are the birds that go down south in the winter but in the summers they come back to breed in the foothills of himalayas and of course then we get birds like this emerald dove uh, which is a resident bird they don't come from anywhere and they do not go anywhere so they can be seen all the year around that's a beautiful bird called indian roller they breed here the resident birds and here we have a common hoopoe now hoopoe is a interesting bird as a kid i always thought that this was a woodpecker i don't know for some reason many people believe this is a woodpecker this is not the hoopoe definitely pecks the ground and looks for insects that are found in the soil but interestingly we get two races of hoopoe and uh, this is the resident race silonensis uh, which breeds here and this picture was taken in the peak of the summer anyway but we also get another race which is a winter migrant and there are very subtle differences because the crest would also have a lot of white marks so if you see a lot of white marks in the crest of the hoopoe uh, which would only probably be visible in the winter because they go back in the summers that is a winter migrant race of the common hoopoe and here we can see a lovely image of a golden back lesser golden back feeding on a termite mound termites are in abundance in corbett corbett is a landscape which has got fantastic diversity of habitat and termites can be found in all these habitat types so various types of habitats in corbett would include uh, riverine grasslands mixed forests sal forests grasslands the typical grasslands and then there is the one man made habitat which is the reservoir if you happen to be in dikala zone you get to access the reservoir which is a lovely place all these habitat types that i spoke about would have abundance of termites and termites form a major part of the food chain for several of these bird communities over probably 200 species of birds in corbett itself would be feeding on termites either uh, the termites that we get to see in this image or the flying termites the swarms when we have the right season there are probably 8 or 9 species of vultures that occur in country in india interestingly all of them have been recorded in corbett now corbett is an amazing place when it comes to raptors out of probably over 70 species of raptors uh, 55 or more have been recorded in corbett now when we talk about vultures some of these vulture species are highly critical this white trumped vulture that we get to see in this image is a critically endangered species uh about 30 years ago anywhere across most of india if somebody wanted to see vultures on any given sunny day all you had to do was to look up in the sky and you would find flocks circling no more 
Suddenly they started disappearing for some time. People had no clue what was happening with the vultures. And then maybe after 10 or 12 years of research, they figured out that there was a veterinary drug which was killing them. So this veterinary drug called diclofenic sodium, when it was being given to the cattle and eventually when the cattle dies and is left out in the open to be fed by the vultures, these birds, especially the white rump vulture, the Indian vulture, and the slender bill vulture, uh, these ones with a very long necks, so they would open the hide and they would uh, insert their necks inside to reach the vital organs because they are specialist feeders. So they would get the fatal dose of diclofenic sodium. And this is what has probably wiped off over 99% population of these three species in last 25 to 30 years. Some of these are just managing to hold on. We can see diversity of birds here, apart from the vulture that we spoke about. This is the tawny fish owl. It is a, it's a beautiful owl species. Uh, it's not easy to come across anywhere other than Corbett. So most of the birders who come to Corbett, this bird would feature very high on their priority list. Then we have something like the great hornbill. Uh, they have amazing uh, nesting behavior. They nest in the cavity of the trees. And right now, because this male is sitting on the ne nesting cavity, the female is right here inside. So when she goes in and she lays the eggs, meanwhile, she seals off the opening with her own feces, leaving a little slit through which the male feeds the female. For over a month and a half, this male would be feeding the female. Uh, he's probably one of the most dedicated husbands. Once the eggs hatch, the female breaks open and comes out. And then the, the male and the female will be feeding the kids together while the cavity is again sealed off for their safety. On the right side corner, we see a streak-throated woodpecker. We spoke about the termites, which is major part of the diet of the woodpeckers. Thanks to this abundance of termites. Well, I have not heard of any other place other than Cobbett that has got 17 species of woodpeckers that occur uh, in one protected area. Right from the tiny little speckled piculet to the great slaty woodpecker, probably the largest living species of woodpecker in the world. We have 17 species of woodpeckers recorded for Cobbett. On the right side bottom, we can see a crimson sunbird, a beautiful little delightful bird. They take nectar from the flowers. And now I'm going to briefly talk about why it is important to look into the habitat of what birds are doing. Uh, sorry, the behavior of what birds are doing. And why it is important to record some of the interesting observations. So what happens when we go looking for the birds, uh, we find them, we ID them, we tick them on a list, but then we many a times don't look beyond that. But if you just look into what has been written about the birds, what is there in the literature, you figure out that you may possibly be witness to something very special, as in the case of this Indian nuthatch. Now, Indian nuthatch earlier was part of the chestnut belly nuthatch uh, species. There were two subspecies. One was uh, this bird and the was chestnut belly, what is still chestnut belly. Later, these two were split into two different species. Indian nuthatch was found in the plains, into the central India, into the eastern Ghats and so on. And chestnut belly nuthatch was here in the foothills of Himalayas. And we thought that what we have is only the chestnut valley nuthatch. The very subtle differences. We found out that this bird was breeding at Jim's Jungle Retreat. So this was probably about three, four years ago that we found it one summer carrying feed. We followed and we located its nest. And this was the first breeding record of the Indian nuthatch from the state of Uttarakhand. 
This was in addition to the avifauna of Gobert Tiger Reserve because the species did not occur on the list of the area. And this was uh, summed up in a short note and published in the Journal of Bombay Natural History Society. And notice this was the diagnostic image. Unless you can see these spots in the undertail cupboards, if these spots are pure white, then this would be a chestnut bellied nut hatch. So sometimes these very, very bad images can also be of great use as record shots. Another very interesting uh, observation, Oriental Skylark, which is uh, a breeding bird in Corbett. It nests in the grasslands. On the ground, I found it to be nesting in, a, in an elephant dung ball. That was very interesting piece of behavior when I tried to study about the nesting behavior of Oriental Skylark and other birds. We found that none of these birds had been recorded nesting in elephant dung. So it had neatly made a space for itself. And imagine in the scorching heat of the summer out in the open in the grassland, if these eggs are laid inside the dung ball, they would have had very cozy surroundings. So again, a brief note in the Journal of Bombay Natural History Society. Now, this was very interesting. Crested serpent eagle is a common raptor uh, of Corbett. I always uh, thought that when there are very few snakes to be eaten, what would this bird be feeding on? But then I realized they, they hunt small mammals. They hunt birds as big as jungle fowl and pea fowl. They catch large insects. They catch bullfrogs, and so on. I was once driving and it was very dramatic as I crossed a forest stream and I was on a little incline. I saw a crested serpent eagle fall out of a tree upside down. In the air, it turned around and came to land on the ground. And as I stopped next to it, it was probably just about three meters away from me. Immediately it flew carrying two bats in its talons, leaving one on the ground. So it was hunting bats. Well, I came back, I looked through the literature and found that there are probably about 22 different races of crested serpent eagle found across South and Southeast Asia. And none of these had ever been recorded hunting bats. I was talking about this to some of my friends in the park and they said they had seen crested serpent eagle feeding on freshwater eel. Again, something unrecorded before. Somebody shared a picture of a crested serpent eagle. You see it on the right side top, feeding on a baby turtle. Again, a new feeding behavior. And then 2016, I remember a jeep had gone out on a safari from the lodge and they saw crested serpent eagle sitting up in a tree with a baby wild boar. So these were all interesting additions to the diet of the bird. And unless we publish this, these will not be uh, taken into the uh, known or scientific knowledge about the bird. So now anybody who is studying the species would uh, report these uh, kind of behaviors. Spot pallid eagle owl is a beautiful owl. It's the largest owl that occurs in the country. We were once blessed that it came and spent one whole day at the lodge. It was sitting up in a tree. We could see it and photograph it. A very handsome owl. But then it was found once hunting the Indian flying fox. So Indian flying fox is, you know, the... the the fruit bat, Indian fruit bat, it's a large bat. But notice how this uh, very large bat is much smaller than the owl. And this was a unique piece of behavior worth recording and worth publishing. 
again this is a, a very interesting species and very interesting observation silverback eagle tail is a bird that occurs from northeast india eastwards through southeast asia there is a disjunct population of silverback needle tail in central nepal now interestingly i think it was probably 2004 that i saw silverback needle tail and because the other needle tail that is supposed to occur here and they are very very fast flyers the other one is white throated needle tail and because the one that i saw did not have a pure white patch i concluded this was silver backed and this was new for us i had a 300 mm lens and uh, it was probably not good enough to photograph this bird that flies at super speed so i requested my dear friend nayan khanolkar who is the famed wildlife photographer he is the guy who took that iconic picture of the leopard walking in the bombay slums for which he got the bbc award so he came and he he took this images with his 500 mm lens handheld and these are not great images but these are good enough to identify the species nail the species the diagnostics and that's how we proved that this is a bird which is new for the western himalayas new for the state of uttarakhand and northern india it's a westward range extension of the species and then how sometimes pictures that are not great can also be useful this is small button quail a summer breeding bird a summer breeding visitor to cobbet it is usually found in the grasslands feeding on the elephant dung it picks up probably insects from the elephant dung it's a tiny little bird and in some fading light uh, i took this picture not a great picture but then somebody was publishing atlas of birds of iran and they did not have images of this bird so they they somehow figured out that i had images of small bird and quail and they published two of my images and that's how sometimes bad pictures also make good reports another very very enigmatic species uh this is bristle grass bird now bristle grass bird as they say we don't know from where it comes and where it goes because it is only seen most of the time in the summers when it is breeding it's a grassland bird uh, as it it is indicative from its name uh, it belongs to the wobble wobbler family and being 20 cm in size it is one of the largest wobblers but we don't really know uh, if it is there in the winters or it just arrives in the summers i recorded its presence in 2004 for the first time i figured out that there was someone who a, a foreign birder who had visited in the late 80s had once mentioned seeing bristle grass bird in dikala grassland that was the only record but then we photographed we i got the permission to go into the park to survey dikala grassland for bristle grass bird uh, in the month of july when the park is closed we got about 30 to 40 breeding pairs maybe over 100 birds were there so this is probably the the largest numbers ever recorded maybe in last 50 years or more so birding you know can be very interesting uh i must point out that birding is a is an activity which is a uh, a very low impact activity you are either uh, walking uh, most of the time you are quiet because you want to see birds so there is no uh, you know disturbance that you are causing to the jungle you're not running around like mad looking for a tiger and let me point out when we go into the park looking for birds and because we tend to spend so much of time in different places we cut off the engine we are looking for birds birders end up seeing more tigers sometimes than tiger chasers because you listen to the jungle also i'll briefly point out this is an activity where you know uh, you can be one with nature 
you can feel the forest you can you know uh, without disturbing any element of the forest you can enjoy the forest all you need is a binocular a bird book maybe a camera a hat is something which helps or a cap and uh, if you have a good bird guide nothing like it what you are not supposed to be doing while you are birding is not to create ruckus be quiet follow what is uh, uh, what are the norms what are the rules of the park stop only where you are allowed to uh, if you are on a trail follow the instructions of your guide and it is an amazing amazing experience i must also point out cobet national park and cobet tiger reserve amazing places uh, cobet national park today is the core zone of cobet tiger reserve cobet national park also happens to be the first national park of both india and asia established in 1936 today the area of cobet tiger reserve is 1288 square kilometers it's a large area and it is a beautiful landscape and it offers so many opportunities of uh, looking for these beautiful gems of the forests now when we go looking for birds we also uh, witness a lot of relationships between predators and prey as you can see the frog being eaten by the kingfisher or the termites being eaten by the woodpecker or the himalayan vulture which is the largest bird of prey that occurs in the country feeding from a carcass right side bottom is a crested serpent eagle feeding on a jungle fowl that it had caught all this is very fragile the ecosystem is very very fragile and there are a lot of threats so i will highlight uh, what kind of threats there can be global threats global warming is something which is impacting every creature now imagine all these winter migrant birds which come here uh, they have evolved in a way that they share relationships with the insects that occur here if they are insectivorous birds so when they arrive their diet is available if they are frugivorous birds when they arrive here certain species of trees or plant would be fruiting so their food is available what happens when global warming hits us the the flowering on the fruiting or uh, period changes or the influx of the insect life changes so this will impact the birds also so that is something which is on a global scale and to control this measures on the global level need to be taken but then we also have a lot of uh, local uh, threats ever increasing man animal conflict more pressure for grazing more pressure for collection of fodder or firewood there are a lot of hotels and resorts coming up the number of tourists that come into the area they may all not be able to go into the park but even outside the park at times this can be little unsustainable so it is more important that people figure out sensible people who want to come and indulge in wilderness experiences like birding should figure out what are the better places to go where they can see what they want to see that's a beautiful image of an oriental honey buzzard they breed here in the summers this is a a bird which can be seen in great numbers at this time of the year again some of the images we had seen earlier but here we have on the right side corner bottom indian scop sow now pollination is one of the interesting uh, uh you know functions that many bird species perform here we can see on the indian coral tree flower uh, an oriental 
white eye. So a lot of these birds come looking for nectar like sunbirds and drongos. Uh, so they, in when they try to reach for the nectar inside the flower, the pollen gets stuck on their beak or forehead or the face. And this is transferred to the next flower to they visit. So we can see uh, crimson sunbird and spangled drongos and golden fronted leaf bird and a purple sunbird all on different kinds of flowers. Another important functions that the birds may perform is seed dispersal. So a typical seed has got, uh, you know, a typical fruit has got a seed in the core, uh, not necessarily for the papaya, which is depicted in the image, but a typical fruit has got seed in the core, which is protected by a hard shell. Outside the shell is the pulp and outside the pulp is the skin of the fruit. So what really happens is that uh, when the fruit is eaten, the pulp and the skin get digested. The seed, which is protected by the hard shell, comes out with a dropping far away from the parent tree. And this is how the seed gets dispersed. And this is how the next generation of plants and trees come up. The bird that we see here in this image is a brown-headed barbet. And also we see black bulbuls, uh, plum-headed parakeets, a juvenile scaly-breasted uh, munia, and then some rose wing parakeets. I'm going to show you some videos, just a few. This is chestnut-headed beetle. It's a summer breeding visitor, beautiful bird. They catch bees in flight. And these uh, black bulbuls visit us in the winter. We have a lot of Indian bead trees. So this is what we call in Hindi bakan. And these bulbuls come looking for these fruits. They spend at least about five to six months with us in the winter. And here we have black francolin, one of the species that occurs in the grasslands. This is recorded uh, in the Laldang grassland close to the retreat. And here we have this gem of a bird called Indian Pitta, which in Hindi we call Navrang because of the multiple colors that this bird displays. I hope you all enjoyed this uh, presentation. I'll be very happy to answer if there are any questions. Thank you so much. Uh, fantastic uh, presentation, Manoj, really. Thank you so much for this. Uh, I think Vibhavya is, he seems to be <laughs> jumping in with a couple of questions. Yeah, go ahead, Vibhav. Uh, yeah, uh, it was very nice presentation. And uh, you know that uh, during my research time, I was in Wildlife of India and I was there in Corbett. Uh, in, uh, in 2006, I was there. Can you right. Me? Yeah. I was there in Corbett in 2006. And I right. can say this is the, this is my favorite park and uh, I really enjoyed I, I learned so many things in corporate uh, it was very nice presentation and uh, it's good to know that uh, uh, you you uh, you also publish paper not only uh, means you are taking tourists uh, for the uh, drive or for birding but you also observe their behavior and uh, you publish paper that is very nice thing uh, it, it's it's very important. Uh, I wanted to, to know, uh, yeah, yeah. Go on. Uh, I wanted to know if uh, yeah. I wanted to know uh, 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 something about collared falconet. I've been collared there falconet. in Corbett so many times, but uh, yes, but I never have seen. So I really so, mean, I really so wanted collared, to see. Yes. Collared collared falconet is a it's a smallest raptor that occurs in the country. It's a, it's a beautiful bird. 
and uh, we we have locations for colored falconet if you want to see anybody wants to see colored falconet uh, you know we can definitely uh, i cannot definitely guarantee because yeah. <laughs> birds have feathers but if you come in the breeding season if you come let's say about uh, march april or so uh, we know locations not the nest locations but yeah of course where they are nesting in the they nest in the forested streams so they nest in the cavities in the trees so they come and perch on on the trees they love to perch on the open uh, you know top branches so that they can keep a lookout for the prey and that these are the opportunities where we can probably hang around in the area and see them i i don't think it's a difficult bird to get we can definitely try to get colored falconet for anybody who wants to see one Yeah, mostly people who go to corvette they uh, the color falcon rate is one of the bird in their list yes so yeah. you know uh, quite a few i would say ibis bill is one uh, yeah, which ibis is a winter bill. migrant a yes. lot of people want to see ibis bill a uh, lot of people want to see wall creeper Doll, dollar bird I've, dollar I've, bird dollar bird, dollar bird yes dollar bird, yeah. it's it's a summer breeding uh, visitor to corvette yeah. so dollar bird is one Uh, remember yeah, Karan, are... uh, Manoj. Remember Karan Lahiri was there. He actually, for him, uh, the collared falconet was. He actually yeah. went out to Corbett to see that, and he saw. I mean, a couple of. He types, saw. And he was so. Yeah, happy. he. Then he yeah, saw the yeah. minla, the blue wing minla. He said that he he saw. That's right. That's right. He was very happy. He's uh he's still communicating with me on and off. Yeah. So he he may probably one day come back to look come for back. more birds. Yeah. yeah. And the black lord tit. That's also Black something that he. Yeah. I remember him telling yeah. me. He sent yeah. me his whole, love, all his photos. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So, uh, Vibhav, uh, nice to know that you were here in two thousand six, and uh, you think Corbett is one of the most beautiful parks. Uh, well, I've had the good opportunity of traveling across most of the landscapes in India. I was leading bird tours for a long time. Uh, I and I hate to, you know, rank the parks that this is the best one or this is the first one and all. they all have to offer something or the other but cobet is not only beautiful in terms of the scenic beauty it offers in terms of the the sheer big mammal experience the tiger the sloth bear the elephant and we have been having fair bit of sloth bear sightings these days in jinnah zone and in dela zone but the birding experience uh, takes it to the next level so cobet offers amazing opportunities diverse opportunities for anybody who wants to indulge in nature and uh, i would also then add on as you said you were here in 2006 uh, in the fourth week of april 1996 i came as a visitor uh, looking for birds a solo backpacking trip uh, i think i uh, something changed and within 3 months i decided to move bag and baggage and uh, after over a quarter of a century i am still here so that is the aura of corbett yeah. yeah exactly exactly and uh, i would like to know the what is the status of water bird because i well uh, so the status water of water birds uh, in corbett is good uh, we have got a lot of uh, stuff uh, visiting our uh, water bodies like uh, dikala uh, you know where we have the access to some area on the reservoir because rest of all it is in core zone so we don't know exactly know what all is visiting or at least on the regular basis but then some of the wetlands like uh, tumaria now tumaria is uh, an amazing place which has given us uh, species like bean goose oh. there is a record of bean goose it's a uh, it's a vagrant to india sorry Very repeat few. that again manoj i i couldn't get what is tumaria it? reservoir yeah Where we regularly do our uh, birding uh, excursions, yeah, it's a nice picnic birding excursion where we go look for water birds. Uh -huh. So large number of species have been recorded there. We get lot of uh, waterfowl. We get sometimes rarities like bean goose has been recorded there. Bean goose, B Be bean goose, B E A N. Oh, okay. I've yeah. not heard about that. Yeah. bean goose has been recorded and uh, one of my papers which is uh, uh, in press at the moment is about the occurrence of a pratincol species which is the first breeding record for the state of uttarakhand it is also an addition to the 
you know birds of uttarakhand and uh, when i first came across them there were probably at least about 5 to 8000 birds on the wetland so yeah we have got lot of water birds but because it is essentially a forest habitat you have to go to specific locations to look for water birds exactly yeah so uh, uh, and uh, of course my favorite bird is uh, great hornbill so what is the status now in corbett that time it was in plenty i don't know now 3 years ago there was a pattern for at least 10 or 15 days you start your morning safari enter from dela gate you stop half a kilometer or 400 meters short of lal dang grassland and you start counting the hornbills so they would cross over from one side to the other side a flock of 6 followed by a flock of 4 followed by a flock of 8 i once counted 90 hornbills within a span of less than 5 minutes wow okay. so their numbers have gone up uh they they do occur across the landscape but uh, i think uh, the sheer numbers that you get to see towards the southern side is amazing and uh, is there any approach from the kalagarh side means a tourist can go from the from the kalagarh side uh, we are hearing that they are probably going to open uh, some area in dhara which is right next door to kalagarh which till now was part of chirna area now unless it happens so probably that area may get opened uh, for access from kalagarh side but then from kotwar side there is a uh, uh, an area called pakro where people can do their safaris this was started maybe last year so yeah there are some areas available in that site on the what's, on the, what's the name again manoj what's the what's the area called again pakro pakro okay and how far from gyms uh, how far no, we cannot approach it no we cannot approach okay it. you can't it's all the other question i had i i had a question is that are the uh, are the lodges are the government guest houses inside open uh, are people are being allowed yeah. to do it and is gyms yeah. uh, facilitating the booking for a night or two like yes yeah, certainly we will be facilitating the booking of forest rest houses for the night stays hmm. uh the night stay experience will start in the november Okay. now since the park these areas will close for the monsoon so bookings will open probably sometime uh, in uh, late september or early october yeah so we will definitely be looking forward to accommodate our guests in these beautiful locations inside the park and so um, currently the the i mean this is just for people listening in what are the uh, what are the zones that are open now which are the um, so the zones that are open now in are dela zone yeah uh jhirna these are through dela gate which is just about 5 minutes drive from the lodge yeah. thereafter one can do a safari to bijrani zone which is close to ramnagar Mm. it takes about 30 minutes from the lodge to reach there mm. then one can do a safari to garjia zone okay which is another 10 minutes drive so about 40 45 minutes drive from the lodge durga devi zone which is little far away you take about 75 minutes to reach there but it's a beautiful zone we have another zone which is not exactly part of cobbet but it is the same cobbet uh, forest extension into tarai west forest division this is a place called fato and we have been having amazing sightings of not only tigers elephants and loads of other things lot of birds in these summer and months. this is a in these months yeah even now even now yeah okay. and it's fato open. opened uh, what's the spelling how do you open fato how do you spell p p h a n t o okay okay fato So Fatu is part of Tarai West Forest Division, which is adjoining to Cobbett, and Fatu Zone is actually an extension of Dela Zone. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Amazing wilderness experience. Forty-five okay, so, minutes drive so, from the lodge. Garjia, Garjia, Durga Devi, Jirna, Dela, and Fatu. Yeah. Yeah. 
right. Rest of the wilderness experience, of course, is happening uh, in the zones next door to us. Jirna was rocking yeah. with all kind of wilderness experience, yeah. whether it is sloth bear this season. Mm -hmm. uh, tigers, of course, you know, almost every day we were having sightings. Elephants. And then both Dela and Jirna, the, because they are more open, accessible, the sheer birding experience is amazing. Okay, great. Uh, any other activities that have been added uh, in uh, gyms now? Uh... Well, we, uh, we... Yeah, we can hear you. I... Yeah, yeah. No, we can hear you. Right. Okay, so we have a number of activities which happen um, within the property. We have uh, this lovely walk, which is called the Mahavan Trail, which is for the first time visitors, where we expose them to what we are, what is the philosophy, what are the different areas, what is the biodiversity, where are all the water holes. And thereafter, we have another walk, which we call a forest secret walk, where we dive deeper in, we talk yeah. about different uh, type of habitats, different kinds of creatures, the synergy they create, the relationships they have, and so on. We have a lovely walk, which is about the waterhole ecology, where we talk about, you know, how things function in a waterhole. And then, of course, we have a walk which is dedicated to the birds, and we have a walk which is dedicated to the, Butterfly. to the butterflies. We have a number of experiences uh, uh, which are uh, uh, within... Uh, walking distance we have a lovely birding trail called dela birding trail where we walk along the edge of the jungle and edge of the village so we get to see birds of both habitats uh, then we we have an activity where we walk through the village and we talk about the life of people in a typical forested village surrounded by you know the buffer zone of Kobe tiger reserve what kind of day-to-day -day challenge they have and so on and so forth. Any of the one gujars still there? Uh, yeah, one gujars are still there. The Tumaria birding excursion, mm -hmm. uh, you know, where we, where we go, we set up a little picnic for them, uh, you know, right at the edge of the reservoir or when the water levels go down, we drive in, we find a little peninsula where there is water on three sides and that's where you are watching your birds and you are enjoying your picnic and you're talking about the birds and thereafter, you drive to the one Gujar Dera next door. Mm -hmm. And this is a beautiful experience where we get to experience the architecture of these people, the lifestyle of these people, how for generations they have been living in the jungle. They don't own any land. They indulge in no agriculture. They are herders. They sell the milk. And uh, I mean, it's all amazing experience. You get to meet them. You get to talk to them. You get to learn their lifestyle. That's what we create out of this experience. Varun here has a question. Uh, go ahead, Varun. Uh, hi, Manoj. Uh, hi, Varun. You went a little late, so you might have already covered it because you covered a very vast variety of topics. Please. I, uh, I came back from COVID yesterday. And uh, this year, I mean, I was really interested by a bird called uh, Hodson's Bush Chat. Hudson's bush chat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, I so you've been for the last 10, 12 years, and I was very happy to see it this year. So any thoughts right. on what happened? Why did it disappear? And what or maybe I so I'll I I will i will I'll tell you what happened. I remember this must have been, if I'm not wrong, this must have been about 2002. So I was leading a bird tour in Tikala, and uh, my dear friend from Nepal, Tikaram Giri, you know, he's a uh, the famed birder from Nepal. So he was uh, the co-leader. So both of us, we had a large group, of maybe about 15 odd people, three, four jeeps, three jeeps or four jeeps. And we were, you know, at, at Leed Khalia and we were watching birds in the grassland and suddenly one of the, uh, the British uh, birder, so he said, this uh, common stone chat looks odd. And then we turned around and we said, oh, this is not common stone chat. This is Hudson's post chat. And that's how, this bird was first seen in, in Corbett. Uh, I remember having seen it for next uh, seven, eight years or 10 years. They always used to be maybe just about two, three birds. There are not too many of them around. Uh, at the most, you know, they could have been half a dozen birds visiting us. Then thereafter, the bird was not 
seen for some time and in in if you've seen my uh, you know presentation i've i've spoken about some of my publications and but one is about the bristle grassbird which is grassland species and in that paper which was published in journal of bombay natural history society i wrote that there should be a fixed pattern uh, of managing the grassland because they do it randomly so sometimes they burn it all sometimes they change the management practice altogether and said burning is not good we will cut the grass i remember uh, i think this must have been about 98 99 we had a director who thought that it is a good practice to harrow the grassland so i have seen 15 tractors with harrow uh, running up and down in the dikala grassland so that is the way we are probably trying to manage our grassland there has to be a long term policy so that all these things adapt to the conditions now we don't know probably something will be more uh, conducive to hodgson's bush chat and something will be more conducive to bristle grass bird but then at the end of the day most of us end up thinking about the tiger and they say oh uh, if we burn it uh, it will sprout and it will attract the deer and that means more tigers will be there but we don't think about the you know the butterflies and the moths we don't think about the reptiles we don't think about smaller things <coughs> uh also to a certain extent i think in last uh, 10 15 years the kala became more tiger centric so the the guides and the drivers were probably not also looking so much for but so that would have also contributed to hots and bush chat going unnoticed uh i'm happy that okay, it was back you unnoticed completely <laughs> <laughs> yeah but uh, you can miss hotsons bush chat uh, almost till uh, march because it, it it it's only towards march that it starts attaining its breeding plumage before it migrates back it, to its breeding grounds across himalayas i i saw it in april Uh, yeah so april and, it uh, must be very striking yes yes yeah but you know february uh, you won't be able to probably tell it apart from a a, a common stone chat because they look very similar except for slight size, yeah. size difference yeah that's what it says i don't think we have uh, any more questions but i, I mean we can obviously with the interest in birding over here everyone's quite uh, tuned in you know so thank you so much for this uh, manoj it's been really fantastic uh, uh, you know i think birding as an activity even for children is just uh, it, it it just gives them a new perspective and you know i mean of course adults too i mean i started i, I mean i started looking at birds much later in my life uh, than i wish i'd done it much earlier you know and i still of course i have major memory issues trying to remember names but uh you know try it's a lifelong it's a lifelong yeah. hobby absolutely you know i'll just add in very quickly a very dear friend of mine started looking for birds when she was probably in her mid 40s wow today <laughs> she's in her mid 60s and she has seen out of 1300 species she has probably seen over 1170 odd species Beautiful. so you can continue throughout yes. your life absolutely absolutely and and uh, i mean the other really aspect of it is that as you mentioned earlier you know it's such a low impact activity yeah uh, you know it's just really fantastic and it's so engaging uh, you you can spend hours and not realize where time has gone by you know that's the beauty of it so it's meditation yeah, yeah. two more things yeah it is two more things manoj uh, in yes. fact belinda belinda was here belinda bigs was here and she was talking about coming back to corbett and start starting to paint birds again so that yes. is another um, another uh, i won't say supplementary activity another creative uh, hobby arising out of watching birds so that's hi a, yeah hi belinda if you can hear me i think she's uh, is she there yeah she's uh, on mute but uh, i remember her visits to us 
Hi, <laughs> she's saying. Such hello. a pleasure to see you. So that now is. The... I still have your artwork which you sent me, Belinda. Thank you so much. That's, the, that's what I see. I mean, look at the beautiful connection that's happened, right? I mean, uh, yeah. uh, it's uh, it, and it's something that stays on much beyond your your visit, uh, you know. And it, I think it's it's yeah, it's it's a lifelong journey and really fantastic. The, the second thing I wanted to uh, talk about in in terms of uh, in terms of uh, uh, birding uh, and yeah. you know uh, getting children engaged. Is that do you have uh, somebody on site who you know because children need a little bit more um, i mean they need somebody gentle and patient who can go with them and point out i mean so that i mean yeah. one of the things i always thought was when kids go to uh, uh, lodges like the Jim jungle retreat they need to go back with uh, not so much as knowing birds or, or the name that's that's not important but just to know that it's not all chidiya right it's yeah. So it's just for them to know that, you know, the beauty and be able to say, okay, this is the, because I've seen it with my children. So they don't, they don't know very well, but they do know that there are different bird species that exist and things. And the, the second thing about uh, coming to some, a place like Jim's Jungle Retreat is taking the fear out of the creepy crawlies from children. Yeah. Yeah. No, we, uh, we have a, a dedicated program for kids. We call it Young Rangers Program. Yeah. Yeah where we have different sessions and one of the session is about birds. We, we do a little classroom session and we take them out looking for birds in the field. We also, you know, talk about all other things, the creepy crawlies and everything. So it's, it's quite a interesting program that we have worked out Very for the kids. Very good. Great. To stop calling them creepy crawlies. Yes. <laughs> we have adults complaining. Yeah. We forget about children. Bugs. Bugs. Yeah. Thank you so much, Manoj. That was really my pleasure. It's a good Absolutely. way to spend a Monday afternoon, actually. Yeah. <laughs> right. Thank and you so much. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you, everyone else, for joining in. So, and we, we look see forward you. to seeing you in Delhi, Manoj. We, we need to. Yeah. Chobna, I, I was looking forward to hearing him uh, the yeah. last time I was in JPR. Hi, Purvi here. Manoj ji, Purvi here. Hi. Hi, Purvi ji. How are you? <laughs> Good, good. And I'm so glad I got to hear you again today. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Manoj, I, I'll never forget that story that you gave when, you know, when we were going to see a tiger when you were sitting on top of an elephant. So, and you thought yeah. you saw a tiger. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thanks. My pleasure. Thank, Thank you. you Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Belinda, for joining in. I don't know which part of the world you are. I hope it is still, uh, it is still reasonable time I, of the day. I see. I see Toby Saab being there as well. Yeah, I saw Toby. Hi, Toby. Can we, we can't see? I'm you. still listening. I haven't just disappeared behind the screen. <laughs> no, we can't see you, Toby. It's a pleasure to connect. It Toby was Saab. a lovely way to start the week. Great. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank, Thank you. you. Good Thank distraction you. from the realities of the world. <laughs> Thank you. Take care. Like, we've recorded this, Manoj, and we'll share it with everyone. We'll yeah. also put it and we'll tag uh, tag you on social media. I think this is thank you very much. This is a keeper, yeah, yeah, definitely. Thank you so much. I mean, fantastic. Lots thank of you, sure. lots thanks, Shobha. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Mudir. Thanks, Shazama. Thank you, Belinda, for joining in. Thank you, Partha. Good. Uh, so, uh, Manoj, so we'll see you. Will we? Will we see you in? Uh, will we be able to see you in July? Uh, uh, what's happening in July? Because we were just planning to do something like uh, on the twenty fourth of July. Uh, Surya is doing something for children at one right. of the clubs here. So right. the other one, we were thinking of doing something larger for uh, Corbett. So it would be yeah. nice to, I mean, once we all decide on it, then we'll, we'll sit and make a program around it. Probably do it at the IIC or the India Habitat Center. Certainly. Certainly we'll figure out. We'll talk tomorrow. Thank yeah. you. 
Thank Thanks, you. Purvi. I'm going to see you soon. Purvi is now given up on me. Okay. Bye. No, then, huh? I've given up on you. So. No, I'm coming. Yes. <laughs> bye. All right. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you, Manoj, again. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank bye -bye. you, Manoj. Bye. Thank you, Chief.